Welcome to Kinship Cafe. I'm your host, Jim Jones. So glad you could join us today. We are continuing our journey through the Tao Te Ching. We are currently in chapter uh, 40. So I will go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. All right. So this is kind of a, a brief one. Um, let's go ahead and just jump in here and, and see what it has to say. Reversal is Tao's movement. Yielding is Tao's practice. So we have interesting way that Tao is somewhat being personified here, and it has two key things that it's trying to highlight. One, the idea of reversal or returning uh, that is a, a key aspect of how Tao moves. So if we think about that larger uh, kind of worldview picture of Taoism that we've talked about in the past in terms of absence and presence or without form and with form, there is this movement back and forth between the two. There's this returning to the source that happens that is this idea of reversal. Uh, and it's also giving this idea that there's uh, time that transpires so in slower or faster ways eventually everything is is changing and moving in that regard uh, and then yielding is something that comes up quite a bit when we're using other metaphors for Tao like water uh, where it will go around things or with a young plant when it says it's able to bend uh, in the in the rainstorm and because of that, it's able to not be broken because it's able to be flexible. It's able to yield uh, as a key attribute of uh, the Tao. So this would be kind of the initial statement that's being made, some key aspects of Tao that are we're being reminded of. And then it concludes with all things originate from being. Now, being here is that word for presence. So, and all things is the 10,000 things. So the 10,000 things then originate from presence, that idea of form. But then it says being originates from non-being. And here's our other two concepts again. Presence originates from absence or the without form. So, very succinct, but it's bringing in some core concepts here. And I've had some meditations of myself on something like this. And, and, and this is maybe what a chapter that's very concise like this is trying to do is giving us a starting point for some reflection. And before I share what my reflections are on this, did you guys have any thoughts or ideas about this? Um, or do you want me to go back to the first slide or let me know? I feel this is very... Over your head? Yeah. It, it, in what sense does it feel? Like all the beings, being originates from not being. That specifically, that's like, what? What does, what does that mean? So do you recall when we've had the discussions about uh, presence and absence? Maybe I don't. So as kind of a refresher then, at a foundational like worldview perspective within Taoism is the idea that essentially everything is one thing. So if we were to think about it from a modern physics perspective, we might say that it appears like all these things that we interact with in our life, our desk, our computer, the chair we're sitting in, other people, the books on my shelf, all seem like separate things, but they're actually all made up of atoms. 
and the same kinds of atoms, right? And the atoms themselves are made up of yet smaller particles. And those particles might actually be something that's part of a quantum field. And so in a very real sense, we can also say from a modern physics perspective, everything is actually one thing. It's just in different configurations that make it appear like they're separate things. But in reality, it's all one. Yeah, that, that's 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 fine, good. But being a non-being, but the the contrast of those two, the antonyms yeah. those two words being. So these are then translated from Wu, and I'm not quite sure how to pronounce the other one that's spelt like you, but I think it's like Yua or something like that. Um, those are the words that are usually that can also be translated as absence and presence. And part oh, of the way we also so. talk about that is also the idea of without form and with form. So being and non-being, you could also think of that as without form and with form, or actually the way around here. If we're going to say being originates from non-being, we could say form originates from non-form or without form. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And, and it, it's really just almost like two different ways to look at the same thing. So if we're trying to look at it from the perspective of, let's say, a, a you know, quantum physicists or quantum, you know, mechanics, what we would see is that everything is just one thing, or we could even talk about the atoms, but those are a very complicated way to talk about life. So if we wanted to, you know, say that I'm going to go over to my friend's house, it becomes very difficult if I need to describe that or, or communicate that in talking about atoms and particles. So we can chunk things up into the configurations that are more obvious that we can see that appear to be separate, even though they're the one thing that allows us to categorize them so that we can actually talk about it and i can talk about who my friend is and i can give you the address of their house and that kind of a thing so that would be how they're looking at the distinction here is that because everything's actually one thing all the things that we see the ten thousand things actually originate from what seems to us like without form or that absence gotcha I noticed something went in the chat, but I I can't read that. Is that something that I need to respond to? Was a bless you from Chad. That's something for my sneezing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks, Chad. Nice. <clears throat> All right. So, um, hopefully, that kind of clears up a little bit of what was being discussed here. But in terms of the thoughts or implications of this, does, is there anything that comes to mind as you reflect on these ideas? And also the, the first two about the Tao being about this movement of returning as well as the practice of yielding. I mean, if you, if you were to not yield and if you were to get into conflict a lot in this way, I would imagine it wouldn't be very practical and survivable for you as a as a theology. So if you were constantly resisting the change? Or even, yeah, the, the change or any kind of pushback in terms of um, like being hard and steady and, you know, sticking to your, sticking to your guns instead of being able to answer, being able to work with uh, the challenges that are presented to you, you would very quickly be called out and as a philosophy or as, a, as an idea or as a as what have you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if there's a, a implication that we are to use the Tao as an example in terms of how we structure our lives, any thoughts on how we might look at this movement of reversing and the practice of yielding 
within the context of keeping in mind the the absence and presence um, in terms of how we live our lives. I'm not quite sure what the movement would be in the universal. Like going back is the movement, is this the return to cycle? But in like maybe just my ESL, but <clears throat> reversal literally to me, I I represent it to myself as going in the opposite direction, not necessarily moving forward between two forms and you know reverting mm -hmm. back to the original state by changing but you know to me that still still indicates a forward move forward movement in a cyclical way but a reversal to me is like no no no, no stop going forward go actually backwards like which mm. to me it seems but maybe it's just language well no that's a legitimate take on that and and it can definitely be translated uh something in terms of returning uh, or uh, as like the cycle kind of a concept revolution, um, you know, that that revolving idea. Okay. Yeah. Then yeah, that, that, that kind of like changes the only constant, right? And mm -hmm. if we have present and absence, if we have to be in thousands and thousands of things. Mm -hmm. I think reversal really stands out for me because it's different from backwards like reversal is back from where you came from versus just going backwards for the sake of going backwards huh. so is any of this um taylor give you any thoughts about in terms of like how you do your day-to-day -day life or is it, I know it's early morning to challenge you with some of these thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I've had like a sip of coffee somewhere. <laughs> um, but for me, it's, it's saying, be, be as true to yourself and to your nature that you can possibly be. And embrace simplicity and be mindful of that i don't know that's kind of what i'm getting mm. return like return to your simplest nature i think mm. got it how are you Chaz? did you have any thoughts Um, I'm still trying to articulate it in my head. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one because it's very uh, somewhat abstract. And so how do we take it from that abstract to the concrete? Um, I kind of wanted to, you know, pause and let you wrestle with that for a minute before I just give you what my thoughts were on it, because I went through a kind of a similar process of, of, the concepts we've talked a lot about and um, i'm very familiar with what they're saying but in terms of why are they saying it why are we reflecting on this why are we taking this time in in the text to pause and reflect on it and it's not simply just as a intellectual reminder there's something here that is relevant to how they're addressing those concerns that they were trying to address at their time, which one is the idea of, you know, that Warren States period, you know, how do we bring that order out of chaos, but also in terms of personal development and cultivation. Um, so that's where a lot of my focus was on is, is what is the connection? here? How can we take this and utilize it or, or think about it in a way that might be relevant to those concerns? So let me go ahead and just share with you what some of my thoughts were there. And, and these are not the end all be all for the answers, just my own personal reflections. So one of the things that especially that reversal or that returning uh, reminds me of is that everything is change. <clears throat> if there's one constant with the Tao, it's the idea that there's constant change. 
So with that being the case, what are some things that come to mind for me? So there's that parable that we've talked about frequently about the farmer whose horse runs away and, and the response to what seems like a, a difficult predicament is we'll see. And we, we find that the situation keeps changing and each of the situations along the way kind of changes its interpretation of was this a good thing or was this a bad thing based on how things continue to unfold. And so the patience that the farmer has in saying we'll see actually allows for the unfolding of these changes uh, that really changes our perspective on the things that have come prior. And it, it, it alerts us to the fact that if we are wrestling with, again, this idea of resisting the change, part of that is going to be because we have a judgment associated with it. And that judgment isn't necessarily a reality. It's very <laughs> subjective. And the fact that it's so fickle, as we see in the parable, about how they keep changing their mind about was this a good thing or a bad thing, helps us to realize, okay, I need to be careful about those judgments. Um, you know, we could, in a certain sense, say there aren't ever any problems. There's only situations. It becomes a problem when we judge it as a problem, when we, uh, when we have this response to it as though it's a problem, as opposed to here's something that's arisen that we need to engage with, and there's different ways that we can address the situation. But if we leave the value judgment out of it, one, it's preventing that kind of emotional roller coaster that can happen. But two, we might notice that there's other ways that this is now unfolding that is more um, helps us interpret or understand a little bit better what's going on. The other one that comes to mind for me, and this is bringing in a, a, a a uh, stoic phrase, memento mori, is the concept of remember your death. So with that returning, uh, there's also the idea that life is is ephemeral. It's not forever. And, uh, you know, it's going to continue for a shorter or lesser amount of time. But for everyone, it's it's in the grand scheme of things relatively short. So we have to think about if that's part of the change that is unavoidable, that is not going to be something that we can escape, then how can we keep that before us in a way that's going to be positive? And of course, for the Stoics, and I think we could see a similar thing for the Taoist, is to learn to appreciate the present moment because it's not an eternity, right? There isn't an ongoing guarantee. So becoming more aware of the present moment and how do we experience life now is key because it might not actually be here later. So if all of our ways of being are focused on the future, when I get that raise, when I get that job, when I marry that person, when I whatever, if everything is constantly waiting for some future event to happen before we can feel like now I can really enjoy and live my life, then all the time that we're spending right now is going to feel like it's either wasted or waiting or in preparation for something else. And ultimately, then we've, we've kind of failed to live or at least experience that we're living in the present. And that future might not ever come. So when we realize or try to keep before us our mortality, then it helps us to stop and smell the roses, right? To really think about, oh, I'm here right now and I am experiencing life. And how incredible is that? Um, yes, circumstances can always be different, but then we've got that we'll see, right? Um, if we are in some type of real crisis, um, you know, like the folks that are suffering under, you know, the wars and things that are happening in other parts of the world right now. 
it's very difficult to be anything other than present. Uh, when disaster strikes or an emergency situation happens, you are just by default in the present moment and you have to be. And certainly there's um, a desire to get to something that's going to be safer and, and more conducive to, you know, life. And that's becomes very urgent part of what you're doing so that it, our life circumstances are going to require different things at different times but for especially us that are you know participating in this conversation most of us have time to sit and reflect about what's the future going to be like or i'm really uh, disturbed about something that happened in the past or maybe something in the past seemed like it was a lot better than it is right now. And in both directions can really distract us from being able to experience the present moment. So this idea that things are constantly changing, that there is a return that is coming, helps us if we embrace that to um, be more fully present and to be less judgmental about what is occurring um, in our, our current life situation. Then the other thing is not to be surprised <laughs> when things change. You know, we can find ourselves rather upset if some significant life situation happens. And um, and part of that's because we get very quickly comfortable to things and we like things to stay the same and not to change. So that we have to be on guard against because it's an illusion. Nothing stays the same. Everything is going to change. So um, if we keep that before us, it'll help us, again, in terms of those emotional swings that are more extreme, to be more balanced in how we're experiencing life if we try to remember, okay, this thing happened, this change happened, uh, this should be not necessarily expected in the sense that we knew this specific change was going to happen, but we shouldn't be surprised when change of some kind happens. Um, and this could be things that we experience as positive or negative. But again, part of that's going to be how we are judging them. And again, taking that perspective of we'll see is really helpful because let's say it's a situation where you lose your job and it can seem like this is devastating. It may turn out that you get a better job that is more productive but if when you lose that job, you are really focused on the negative aspects of it, which is easy to do, because all of a sudden you're trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to pay my bills and where am I going to go from here? Um, but the more we get caught up in that negative uh, approach, the less productive the way we think is. Uh, fear has a, it's like a vice, a clamp on the mind that really stops it from focusing the way that it needs to be in more of a creative way when we need to be doing something like how do we explore new possibilities or taking advantage of the opportunity for something like reinventing ourselves or trying out a new direction. And so this is where we want to limit those kinds of emotional extremes, not because emotions are bad, they're very important, but they can also really prevent us from being able to focus on what we need to do so being aware of and really internalizing change is a constant. So I shouldn't be surprised when change happens. Uh, will be things that really help us through those times of, of change. Before I go on to my next screen, any thoughts on these couple of uh, reflections? I had one thought in terms of the change being constant. I think one of the one of the things that I have to keep myself in check now that you're going to talk about how we want them to stay the same. I have been in a state of change for a very long time, constantly driving, moving towards a goal, and trying to you know be constantly changing. But my expectation is that the change is going to be in one directional. That everything's going to mostly work where I'm going, to, I'm going to be the initiator of the change towards the direction that I want it to be. And whether, uh, you know, whether I'm not, I am in a charge or whether I'm in, uh, in, in control of that particular change, it's a different conversation, I guess. But while I strive to keep 
going in the one direction. There is still, to your point, so many changes in other vectors that are moving my uh, moving myself, and I have to adapt to those changes to change. Instead of from here to there, I have to change from here to there. I need to be constantly changing the way of change that I'm doing to adapt to how my situation changes itself. And it's it's really easy to forget that while my, my desire change is the biggest change that I'm focusing on, that I'm observing the most, that I'm trying to enact the most, there is still a lot of changing underneath it that I'm even oftentimes forgetting or trying to not to think about. Um, so that was, a, that was a new thought that you, you made me think about. Anybody else have anything they want to share? Was this a helpful, uh, some categories uh, in relationship to this passage? Yeah, I think so. I think it's really hard to get yourself to expect and welcome change. <laughs> um, like you said, like the losing your job example is obviously extremely scary and rightfully so yeah um so it's hard to imagine that happening and just being like we'll see <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is definitely not something that that seems to come all that naturally right but part of that's because of the conditioning we have about a number of other things as we get older and we've actually gone through some of these transitions in the past that also helps us because then we can look back to when did i think it was like this before and what happened you know and and that gives us a little place where like okay the world didn't end last time this happened yes there was you know some struggles that i had to go through to get to the next point but there is a next point, right? And and so how can I then start to, to work more productively by being more present and being aware of what's actually going on instead of the fears and concerns about the future uh, or regret about the past? If I can be more in the moment, then I can ideally be more effective at getting to the next place by being open to possibilities and creativity and so forth. Yeah, I, I think that's really kind of a key thing is just how do we get back to being present and less judgmental about situations and people and everything really for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then so we... now that you now that you're mentioning it in this regard, I'm there's another thought that kind of comes up comes to my head in terms of it just depends on the type of change. And when my partner lost her job a year ago, that was a huge change because we were in the middle of looking for a new house, and that ruins everything, right? That changes a whole lot. But when we when we go through you know life in terms of you know. I think those big, we lost to lose a job and we need to start taking big steps. Okay, well, this is a horrible thing. This is a lot of change. This is a, it has an impact on our living. And we need to make a lot of adjustments or a lot of changes for our lives to survive, to, to make it through, to get back to the same point. Like there's a lot of steps you need to take. It's a one thing versus when you have small changes like inflation, cost of living, um, the legislation that's that's being created or re reorg happening in our in our company that is just way too high for it to impact my impact my day because it is, there's a lot there's a big difference between what type of change it is what how does it impact your current living or your current goals that you, or whatever you're trying to achieve and there is a like you need to not necessarily I think saying that be more present, be less emotional about the change is a, it's a maybe too big of a statement for me in terms of, I think I want to qualify in terms of be present as much as you can in regard, in the, in the scale of the change that you're facing. Because there's just things that you may be more okay with, more taken in and say, you know what, 
it doesn't impact me as much. I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna be not gonna be so much judgy. But if it's a my parents died, my, my, my I lost my job, or my house burned down, those are changes that you have to react to. There, there's no way that you can say, well, you know what? We'll see how good it's gonna be. I think that it's it's important qualification to acknowledge for for ourselves that not everything is gonna be. We'll see. Well, the the we'll see isn't. It can give the impression of inactivity, and that's not exactly the right thing. So even if we think about the farmer story, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's still, you know, maybe repairing the fences to keep the horses inside. His son is actually working to break in one of the horses. So it's not a, a just sit back, yeah. watch how the world unfolds. It is how we approach the changes when they happen. And we'll see can can maybe feel a little bit dismissive, especially if we're talking about something, you know, more tragic, like you said, the house burning down or, or losing your parents. But the concept is a little bit the same. So and, and, and death is always a, a tricky one, right? It's one of the reasons I have the memento mori here, because not only do we need to remember that that we're going to die, but everyone we know is going to die. And, and there isn't anything we can do about that. And so how do we... There's an aspect of how we cultivate ourselves or prepare ourselves for that eventual reality right? So in thinking about our loved ones, uh, you know, we have to remember it's a, everything is, is temporary, right? And it might not even be that they, they die, but it could be something like they get hurt or they get sick or, you know, lots of different oh. things. So how do we, how do we best address that? Well, one is again, this idea of being present in the moment, if we're not waiting until this certain thing happens before we can have the kind of relationship that we want, right? Or or whatever with with somebody else, um, then we're missing out on participating in those relationships in the present. And and so there's a part of how do we be present now with the different situations that are going on in our lives? How do we be more understanding about other people's situations or character traits or things that that might have the ability to irritate us um, there's different ways that we can come to be more compassionate about the differences in other people that allow us to be more present and also then remembering because change is inevitable that um it's almost kind of like a pre-grieving kind of, I think is a way that I might put it. The Stoics had this idea of negative visualization, of trying to imagine what life would be like without something in it, like whether it was uh, something like you coffee cup or up to your child, right? And in doing so, the idea is that it helps you to be more appreciative of it in the moment and, and to demonstrate it. And maybe the final part of this then is where that, what we think about what death is. So clearly with a lot of different religious traditions, there is a way to soften the blow, let's say, by having this idea of an afterlife uh, or some type of reincarnation or something along those lines. Um, from a naturalist perspective or a Taoist perspective, they don't there isn't anything like that. So um, part of how that's understood from more of a Taoist perspective is, again, this absence and presence. If everything is one thing, but just in different configurations, then the thing that I am, the thing that all my loved ones are, is actually all connected. And when the particular configuration of myself or someone I love about, um, a love, dies that is not in a sense lost the uniqueness of that particular presence is now gone but everything that that person was in terms of what made them up is still part of the same process 
it's not exactly like a reincarnation, but it's almost like a, a recycling, <laughs> you know, that, that it's, it's going back into the mix that's going to participate in how this ongoing experience of reality and life happens that can give a sense of comfort as well, that, that it's this ongoing cycle. What I was before I was born is what I'll be after I die and same with the others. And, so there can be a, a comfort that comes in that as well. And also recognizing that eternity uh, isn't necessarily a good thing. <laughs> when you start to think about what would happen to the way we look at life, if we knew for certain that we would never die and we had countless years to live, um, it is almost as detrimental as recognizing that life is short because nothing has any meaning at that point. What makes things significant and have meaning is the fact that they don't last, that gives it that special um, moment in time. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of approach that, but gotcha. all those things help in the sense of being present, being aware of what is actually there instead of my my desires or you know my shoulds uh, or my regrets allows us to be more physically and, and emotionally present to essentially take advantage of the time it's funny you mentioned the um we're gonna be how we were before there was a time before we were here and there's gonna be a time after and it's probably gonna be the same that's kind of how I make myself feel better about the inevitable, you know? Yeah. Like, I didn't know, and I won't know, so it's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not the most fun conversation, but I think it's an important conversation because the more we are running from that, then the, the more likely we are to try and distract ourselves with things that are detrimental whether it's escaping into, you know, reckless lifestyle, uh, you know, relationships, drugs, alcohol, or, you know, even just adventuresome type things, you know, things that are trying to distract you from the reality of that can, can not always be the most healthy way to deal with it. So, yeah. All right. So then the final part, the yielding versus resisting. One of the things that we see frequently, again, with the, the young green plant and the water is this flexibility allows for the possibility of life and how that happens. But if we then think about the uh, returning, <laughs> that flexibility is eventually going to become stiff. Right. And and of course, that then is kind of more of the metaphor that's leading to the idea of death. But it's also something that we can expect and we can observe in others. As we get older, besides <laughs> the stiff of not being able to move as well, uh, there's an interesting thing that happens where people start to get stiff in their thinking. Um, and start to become very fixed in a particular way and unchanging, right? So this is where we, again, start to see this idea of not just like physical death, but kind of like thought death or emotional death. And a very interesting time in our culture right now where there's a lot of that, that stuckness, that stubbornness that's really holding on at the moment. And I think it's because we're getting ready to go through a pretty significant shift in terms of from more of a social uh, outlook on life. But I hope so. <laughs> yeah, but this is also part of the reason why it's Maybe good shift. that we don't live forever, right? Because <laughs> there's going to be yeah. ideas that come up that are going to be beneficial that maybe we're resistant to because it's really pushing our comfort zone. But, you know, that stiffness, that inflexibility that comes with getting older and set in your ways is not a productive thing for the future. So there's that returning that becomes really important. And, and the more we can practice that yielding and learning how to be flexible, um, 
the longer we're able to maintain that way of being, then the the more vibrant uh, we'll be as even as we go into old age. And this doesn't even have to be like long term type things too. Like, um, I noticed this about like winter time, where in the winter you don't you get the cabin fever, and it's more <laughs> of because you can't go anywhere. It's cold outside, at least for where I am. Um, it's so cold outside, you can't really do anything, and you kind of everything slows down, and you become complacent, and life just it, it feels very dull sometimes because you're just kind of stuck in your ways because you don't have a whole lot of options in the middle of winter time around here. Um, but then that's why it kind of everybody gets excited about springtime because that's when it starts to warm up you can go outside and do things and life seems to speed up and that's where like a, a springtime is whenever you're that everybody's mood starts to lift um again it, it's probably more based on your area because like californians it's probably not as bad in the winter um <laughs> but uh even there, it's probably a very similar lifestyle because it, even though it's not cold to me, it's cold to them. <clears throat> and they probably do the same thing. They don't go outside as much and things like that. But uh, that kind of moving and changing does bring about life. Um, because whenever you're not actually doing anything, you're it, it just feels... Uh, like well, it's on the screen stiff versus yeah. you know, like I'm so excited for spring I have so many things I want to do and I'm really, really excited to go outside and start doing stuff but uh, it's like I, I realized my entire uh, outlook or just demeanor changes in like towards the end of winter because it's like I'm I, I just feel stagnant hmm yeah. Same. Yeah, and that's the key thing is it's not just a a one cycle, right? It's it's an ongoing cycle and the seasons are definitely part of that. So, you know, the summer into winter, back into summer again and, you know, that fall and spring where you have that transition periods, those are all um, you know, seasonal things that definitely apply to the larger scope of our our life as well as societies and civilizations and you know, we talk about, you know, the, the spring and the autumn of different uh, cultures even. So, yeah, it's, uh, there's different scales we can think about this on too. And it definitely is a, on a repeating scale for us as well. And the final thought here, since we're coming up on time, is, um, you know, if we're understanding this, then that everything has a common source. It really um, it can be used as a way to think, you know, that the ideas of superiority or pride or justification for domination kind of fall away. That doesn't make as much sense. There's when we start to see how everything is connected, everything is made of the same stuff, everything comes from the same place, then a lot of our um ways of viewing the world that can bring about that injustice and that inhumane way of being uh, lose a lot of their justification. So I think that's another key area. And there we go. So any final thoughts before we sign off? Yeah, that last line kind of brought me back to a thought I was having earlier when it was mm -hmm. talking about going back to uh oh my gosh i forget the line it was like going back to the yeah being arises from not being or ten thousand things arise from being so just like basically going back to your basics and just remembering you're part of that and that so is everything else and not getting a big head over anything because we all come from the same place and we all end up in the same place. <laughs> so yeah. exactly. Well, I want to thank you guys for being here today. And if you're watching this on video and you'd like to join us, um, 
you can register your email at www.kinship.cafe and you'll get announcements with the links for our Friday morning Zoom conversations as well as uh, information about where we meet in person if you happen to be in the Southern California area. And um, yeah, we'd love to see you then and take care, everybody. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>